side. Okay, so going back to Ron's point on the left-hand side, we've got a, a y-axis that's labeled percent by volume in dry flue gases. If we look, for example, at 120% theoretical error, we come up, we look, and that's about 4% uh, O2. So this is getting more into the analysis than perhaps I want, but just suffice it to say that the y-axis changes based on the fuel type, the magnitude, I should say, it does. And uh, there's a correlation based on what parameter you're looking at. As we move to the left of the theoretical air requirements of 100%, we're now burning rich, fuel rich. You can say it's fuel rich, it's air lean, it's the same thing. Much like on the right-hand side, we're running lean, that's with respect to the fuel, or air rich. Generally, in our industry, we talk about it from a fuel standpoint. So on the left-hand side of the 100% mark, we're now starting to burn rich, meaning we're now bringing more free carbon into the equation than we've got free oxygen to oxidize with. So now we begin to generate uh, the, the carbon monoxide that we really want to avoid. Okay. What you'll see along the top is a curve of carbon dioxide, which for many years was one of the measurements that we had made when setting up burners before we had the ability to so quickly measure carbon monoxide. But you'll see that it peaks at the theoretical point of 12% um, CO2 for natural gas. As you drop the air available or uh, add more fuel, you'll see that that value drops off. So that's one of the many reasons we don't trim based on it or look at it very much because in this scenario, you can't tell which side of stoichiometric ER by simply looking at CO2. We generally look at CO and O2 and other gases of interest when, when looking at it from an emission standpoint, but the, uh, CO2, the CO and O2 are, are basic needs to measure when, when setting a burner up. So to just to generalize, is, mm -hmm. is it accurate or safe to say that as we get to the, to the left uh, of the 100% theoretical error, that we're talking more about safety concerns, and right. as we get to the right of the 100%, we're talking more about efficiency, efficiency concerns. concerns. Okay. Right. And that's why yeah. this process is so critical to have someone qualified look at your combustion application and, and keep it in check on a regular basis. You'll notice at the bottom, and this is kind of an interesting point, where we have a y-axis value of zero, and uh, we've got the vertical intersection of uh, that at 100% theoretical error. You would think that, in reality, your CO would drop to zero at the point when your free oxygen drops to zero. And that would, in theory, be true. But when you look at any burner application, it's very difficult to maintain enough mechanical reaction to cause the fuel and the air to mix intimately enough so that absolutely everything is oxidized and there's no leftovers. Kind of like when you partner plan a party at your house, you always have more food than, than guests, right? You always want to have some free oxygen left over. You want to have some free food left right. over. But with that, we, we always have... You've some, never been to my house for a yeah, party. Exactly. <laughs> There's always some hungry people, even though you've got food left over. Okay, it's, a, it's a, hopefully a good analogy. But you'll see at the bottom that the two do not intercept truly at uh, zero. So you can have coexistence of carbon monoxide and free oxygen in your flue gas, and uh, the, the obvious goal there is to make sure that we minimize the generation of carbon monoxide. Now, not shown on this graph, but equally real, is that when we have mechanical problems with the burner, firing head issues, parts that are burned or missing, you will find that in reality, as you set your fuel air ratio, you'll not be able to achieve low levels of carbon monoxide. So what we're really doing is bringing a fuel uh, envelope to play and we're bringing air potentially around it. We're not busting that fuel envelope up and allowing intimate mixing before we, we go into our uh, combustion region on the burner. So what we want to do is look at this on a regular basis and look for trends, changes and such that might be indicative of mechanical changes in the burner itself. Okay, so it, this is one of the times when not being able to see the audience is, is a little bit of a drawback. Yeah, so sure is. If I could see everybody out there, I would be looking at you asking you, are we sure we got this? And I mean, I don't know, obviously we're broadcasting here. So what I would I would strongly suggest to you is that if you have questions, because we're gonna move, move off past this slide now. If you have questions about this, now would be a good time to write that down. Because when we get to the Q&A, if we need to come back to this, we certainly can. Sure. Okay, exactly. John, let's talk a little bit about some fuels other than natural gas. Right. 
And certainly in this area, in the Midwest, we have uh, fuel oil as a backup if you're on interruptible service. Uh, natural gas tends to be the primary fuel with most of our customers, and we serve a lot of different applications in a lot of different industries. But uh, what we'll typically find is propane sometimes as a backup or coal as a primary fuel where natural gas might be the ignition fuel or a backup. But what you'll find here is that uh, a summary of the useful forms of the fuel. So, for example, propane is shipped as a liquid in containers under fairly high pressure. It's uh, brought through a vaporizer where heat is added. We actually cause the liquid to boil. It doesn't boil at a very high temperature, really. It's fairly easy to do, but it's actually burned as a gas. Uh, fuel oil, of course, is shipped as a liquid, but as uh, we get closer and closer to attempting to burn it, we find that the liquid itself really doesn't burn. So we atomize it, we bust it in a really fine droplets uh, of vapor, if you will, using either compressed air, mechanical means, or steam. So it's burned as an atomized liquid. Of course, a coal is, is burned as either small solids or powder in the case of um, the larger utilities and such. But you'll see that the fuel contains varying amounts of heat. Uh, the heat content varies. So going back to our other example, natural gas is about, and I say about, 1,000 BTUs a cubic foot. Uh, propane, as you can see, in its vaporized form is about 2,500 BTUs a cubic foot. And you can read on. But the important point here is on the right-hand side, we've got an approximate fuel or ratio. Now, this, again, goes back to the textbook scenario, where 10 to 1 would be the theoretical or psychometric mix. In reality, that's a little higher because we want some excess air in the equation, as we do for uh, burning propane or oil or coal or any other fuel. But the magical thing you'll see is that the combustion air requirements are really a function of the BTU content of the fuel. So when we see about 2,500 BTUs a cubic foot for propane, amazingly, our fuel air ratio has changed. So now instead of needing 10 cubic feet of air for one cubic feet of gas, we now need uh, two and a half times that because that's relating back to our, our heat content of the fuel. So when you think about, for example, let's say a boiler, which has got one forced draft fan on it that's developing the air volume for a combustion process, we don't obviously change the blower size based on which fuel we're firing. We change the volume of fuel delivered so that we can use the very same fan. So under uh, propane firing conditions, we have a much lower volumetric flow of fuel required to release the full amount of heat in that boiler than we do when firing natural gas. Okay, so John, is, is it safe to say then if I had, say, manufactured gas, right, in, in a coal plant someplace, about right? 500 feet. It's about five. Feet. So yeah. that, would, that would probably have a ratio of five to one. Mm -hmm. Right. And if I had butane, which is even more potent than propane, more uh, what, is, what is it, about 5,000 or so? No, 3,200. 3,200? Okay, so, mm -hmm. so then that ratio would be somewhere around 32 to 1. Right. Mm -hmm. You could kind of predict where right. it's going to go. Right. Okay. So it's important that um, this, this ratio, which is kind of pivotal in our discussion, is kept in mind. The other thing that's pivotal, of course, is that the mixing occurs, and it does it well, so we can, we can get full release and get all the heat out of it that we've paid for. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll stop and kind of take a deep breath here and uh, maybe just kind of get ourselves synced again. So what we did to this point is, you know, we did our, our definition of combustion, and uh, by the time this is over, we're still going to learn why John crawled into that boiler. Um, we talked about the, the combustion triangle and looked at our very simple, straightforward uh, example of striking a match. We talked about uh, mechanical and chemical aspects of uh, combustion. Mm -hmm. uh, remember when we talked about mechanical, John used the example of the balloon on the bottle in the boiling water. And on the chemical, we talked about the uh, kind of the sub-reactions, if you will, and the importance of going completely through to water vapor and carbon dioxide. Yep. Okay. And, resolve. Mm -hmm. and then we looked at the combustion equation, uh, both kind of in a perfect world and in a real world where we start to talk about excess air. So. This is probably the, the end, I would say, of what we would be talking about that's kind of theoretical. Right. We're going to talk a little bit more yet about combustion, but we're going to move into more of the, uh, of the real world, if you will, and get even more practical with our Exactly. Examples. And again, to this point, we're envisioning many different combustion applications. We're going to stay in our boiler world only because it's a, it's a common thing that we can all talk about. The next obvious question is, how is this done? Okay, so I've got a volume of gas. I've got a volume of air. 
I don't know where they came from or where they're going. Okay, here's where we're going to talk a little bit about where the fuel and the air is going. This is a typical boiler burner uh, made here in Wisconsin and Monroe. It's made by industrial combustion, but they all pretty much work very similarly. And here's a nice cutaway I had found on the web. We've got an induction motor that's direct coupled to a fan. We draw combustion air from the surrounding environment. We add energy to it to build its static pressure, and the air passes from the left to the right through a diffuser where it mixes with fuel and then combusts out in this region. It's called the oven. That's the root of the flame that's used to reflect heat back into the root of the flame to perpetuate ignition. The uh, pilot itself is a very small flame in contrast to the main burner. We essentially use a spark in this burner to light a pilot. The small pilot then is used to light the main burner. So you can see how each step successively builds the, the, the flame uh, size. Let me ask you a question, and, and I realize there is not a perfect answer to this question, but if I'm looking at the flame, are there, are there signals, are there tips I can get from the appearance of the flame that help me understand what's going on? That's a really good question. And in years past, a lot was done on the eye, really, when fuel was not that expensive. I would never encourage that. I would encourage the use of a combustion analyzer under any conditions because, from my experience, there are some burner designs that are really not suited for a good deal of forward velocity under lower firing rates, meaning we don't have a lot of activity. The blower doesn't develop a lot of static pressure. We don't bust the fuel envelope up, up very well. And what you end up with is really what looks to be a pretty lousy flame. But mm -hmm. in reality, if you look at it with an analyzer, that's not so bad. Other burners, they, they have what visually appears to be a very good flame under most firing conditions, but you can be fooled. About the only thing I found, and this is really something that has to come from experience, is when you look at the very tip of the flame, if it's somewhat lazy, hazy, or smoky, you might have an issue. Although I've seen some cases where that's not even true. So again, I'm not trying to propose uh, that I, I would really encourage the use of uh, the measuring tool, as we'll call it, the analyzer. So now we know you did not crawl into that boiler to see what the flame looked like to judge if it was any good or not. No, I just was not thinking that day. So on the right-hand side, uh, we take our fuel from our gas train and our combustion equipment. Uh, again, we, we think about this from the burner management system standpoint. There's going to be safety shutoff valves, gas pressure switches, all those types of safety devices that the fuel will pass through before it gets to the burner. On the right-hand slide, let's just assume that those things are depicted, but the fuel comes in, it goes through a butterfly control valve, and in this example, the fuel fills this firing head, which then passes through the main gas orifices here. There's also a secondary valve on this particular model, which is used to control the flow of gas to the secondary gas spuds. There is two flame envelopes, if you will. One is somewhat pre-mixed, and the other one is more nozzle-mixed. It's done for strategic reasons and fuel ratio and clean burning. 